Here we go. Going live. I think it's working. We've got an internet connection. Hello, everybody. Bob Loves to Pawn Boss coming at you live right here on the Pawn Boss Facebook channel. Looks like we've got a few folks checking in already. Glad to see that. Holy cow, I need to talk to you all about uh, what happened last week. <laughs> I got quite a few emails and some texts and actually a couple of phone calls wanting to know if we were okay. Well, let me tell you what happened. Y'all need to know this. We're, we're, we've been hanging out in an RV until our house closes and we get it remodeled and ready to go to live in. And, and uh, we've been hanging out at the RV at my son's place, our son's place. And, and I heard a, and you, you heard me say, oh, I got distracted. I heard a pop, which sounded to me like an arc but I didn't hear a breaker throw. And then we smelled smoke. I smelled uh, electrical fire smoke. Well, you don't want to be in an RV when that thing catches on fire. So I said, I got to go. Popped up, touched the phone, trying to turn this thing off, but I didn't. So you guys got to listen to how some of that played out before I closed uh, the show off. But what actually happened was <coughs> there... Uh, there was an electrical short, and the main power cord coming into the RV, the receptacle, some water must have gotten in it. Something happened. A power surge, something happened. But it arced and burned up that plug. So where the power cord comes from the source and plugs in, and we were plugged in, adapted to a 50-amp plug for a 30-amp RV. So it didn't throw the breaker because it didn't pull 50 amps. So anyway, we were pretty fortunate because there was nothing there for it to catch fire. And uh, we repaired it the next day. I called the RV guy that night. He told us what to do. We unplugged it from the power source, went over to our son's house, and we slept in one of those beds that night. But it's all good. It's all fine. It all worked out just right. Well, hey, I got several topics to talk to you guys about tonight. I thought uh, <coughs> with, the, <coughs> with the part of the south, the southwest, <clears throat> part of the southeast with heavy floods. I know like Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, <clears throat> our, our good buddy Ron Ardoin, man, I don't know how Lake Charles is not a permanent lake all over, not just Charles. With the amount of water that those guys have had. But uh, good gosh, right here where we are. Now we're hanging out at a hotel in Glen Rose, Texas. We closed on our house last Friday. Debbie and I went and looked at it together for the first time yesterday, right on the Brazos River. We're pretty pumped up about that. It'll be a great setting to do some videos if I can figure out how to get an internet connection in that remote little subdivision called Pecan Plantation. So pretty excited about that. We spent part of the day today making plans where actually I just carried the tape and took notes because she's the one that's going to be figuring all this out. Say, hey, you guys know the drill. Hashtag bomb boss. <coughs> so here we go. My throat's already playing games. So you know the drill. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine. Click like. <coughs> Share this to your timeline. You're eligible for a drawing for a Palm Boss hat and a Palm Boss mug that knows how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. We don't know how it knows, but it knows. But you're eligible for one of those if you'll do those three things for me. Remember, Palm Boss Magazine, 35 bucks a year, cheaper than a Friday night date. I thought she'd look at me, but she didn't. <laughs> this lasts a year. Our date, we, we went to celebrate a little bit last night, and it was more than $35. So anyway, if you want to subscribe, you can call the office, or you can subscribe on the Palm Boss website. John Funk, hi from mid-Michigan. We've had a heat wave coming our way. You have one coming. In the low to mid 90s, so tell me I'm correct to change my aeration from 24 7 uh, to 7 p.m. You know what? I would do that. I sure would. So here's what John's talking about. When you're aerating with bottom diffused aeration, <coughs> and you're going to go through a hot spell, and especially if you've got cool water fish <coughs> or like largemouth bass. Largemouth bass don't like water temperatures above about 84. Whereas if you're running your diffuser 24 7, I've documented, documented a number of lakes where the ambient temperature, like in Texas, southern Oklahoma, and parts of Louisiana and Arkansas, will get up over 87 or 88 degrees. 
for your biggest, oldest bass, that's that's deadly. You know, the, the biggest ones, you're going to lose a few. So what, what my advice to people has been is if you run it from like 9 at night till 9 in the morning, then you're going to get the coolest part of the day. Your water temperature is going to be cooler, and it's going to be healthier for the fish. Now, I've got an article coming out in the next issue of Pond Boss that you're going to want to read. So if you haven't subscribed, you need to get on that. It's an article written by Matt Rail, where he worked with uh, Outdoor Water Solutions' John Red, with a pond owner that has a pond that's about 70 years old in Indiana in a cornfield farm, a corn farm. And it, it's filled over the years mostly with field tiles. So that water, is it, it's hyper eutrophic. That guy would have a fish kill every year. So the experiment was, can we use solar powered aeration to run you know, anywhere from five to 12 hours a day? Will it destratify a pond? Will it push oxygen to the bottom? And will it prevent a fish kill? The results are pretty darn interesting. It's something that makes a lot of sense and you guys are, guys are gonna wanna read about that. Now, what I wanna talk tonight about is a little bit more about floods and droughts and I wanna talk about do-it-yourself fish evaluation. How do you evaluate your pond? So we're gonna hit those topics. John Elmer, hello there. Travis Paul Smith checking in. Good to see him. I see Vito. Vito's raising a chef. He's got a son that is a great cook. I'm <clears throat> looking for an invite. Michael Gray from Tennessee. Michael Eric from Iowa. Michael, where he is in Iowa, it's the, the climate's been pretty dead gum uh, warm and dry. They're not getting the same range. You know, when El Nino shoves the jet stream south, the southern tier of states really get hit with lots of rain. And I'm gonna tell you about one of, one of the consequences of that rain here in just a minute. But when you're north of that, you're not getting the same rainfall that you typically get. So at La Nina, when the jet stream rises, that's when, like Michael Eric, will be getting rain and, and over here in central Texas, south Texas, all the way over to south Louisiana, they won't get nearly the amount of rain. There's Drew Bachman from the Carolinas, Roger Peterson, Hi, <clears throat> Bob. Here in mid-Missouri, I have a pond that has pea soup colored algae bloom, commonly referred to as pond scum. I have aeration that runs only at night since my water temperatures are rising. My question is, should I let the bloom run its course, or should I use an algae side like Q-Train Plus to get rid of it sooner as it's not appealing to look at or swim in? <clears throat> I'm going to tell you, if you want to get rid of it, go ahead and get rid of it, but don't kill it all at once. Uh, thin it out. So, treat with a uh, use a uh, chelated, uh, chelated compound like q Plus, that's a good choice. And follow the label, but only treat a certain piece of the pond to dilute the bloom. Don't, don't put it in at full force, because you want to thin it out. Now keep measuring your visibility, guys. I can't emphasize that enough. <clears throat> if you'll measure your visibility, then you can make smarter decisions. If, if, uh, if you were to tell me, Roger, that your visibility was six inches, I'd say, ooh, let's have a phone conversation because you're gonna to need to take that out three or four different treatments. But if you say, well, it's 24 inches and it's pea soup and the bloom changes, I see uh, it's changing color, <coughs> I'd probably tell you not to do anything about it. But <coughs> I don't know why I'm coughing. I ain't coughed all day. I think it's the angle of my head. Uh, but the answer is, if you want to treat it, yes, you can. The water's not too hot to do that right now. Mike Cottrell. Boy, you guys have had some rain, too. Good gosh, you've had rains just training on top of you. Nancy Bishop, good to see you. Nat, Nancy's got it. Hashtag Palm, Mag Palm Boss Magazine in the uh, comment section. Click like, share to your timeline. You're eligible for that drawing I was telling you about. John Funk still dry. The Lancasters are watching you on the big screen. Holy cow. I saw a text come across, but I didn't get to read it because I was in the middle of doing this. So that's just, that's super duper. Watching me on the big screen. Does the big screen make my face look fat? <laughs> Devin Thompson, good to see you, Devin. Travis says, I want to mention about my Purina dealers. My dealer is a small one and they're happy to supply two bags to 12 bags or a pallet. Now, part of the reason that uh, he's making that comment is there's been a little bit of, of um, talk 
here in the last few weeks on the Palm Boss uh, discussion forum with especially one guy in particular, Kenny Sanderson, up in Northwest Kansas, having a hard time getting fish food. And it's, it's really an interesting thing because, you know, they, got, they have an outstanding fish food. Karina makes the best fish foods out there. The Aquamax lineup of feed, I'd put it up against any of them. <clears throat> the problem that they run into sometimes is distribution. It's not always easy to get that thing into the, into the customer's hands. Now, there's a lot of reasons for it. Sometimes the sales rep for that dealer, so, so you go to your dealer and say, hey, I want to buy, buy two bags of Aquamax MVP, and you live in Goodland, Kansas. And the dealer says, well, let me see if I can order it. So he orders it online, doesn't get a response, assume he ordered it, then his order comes in the next week and it's not there because they got shorted out of that distribution center. So he calls the sales rep. The sales rep says, well, you got to buy a pallet. Not true. That sales rep probably knows way more about horse and cow feed than he does fish food. <coughs> so sometimes there's a breakdown <coughs> in the communications from the manufacturer through the sales rep, the distribution center, and the dealer. And 99 times out of 100, it's a mistake by the dealer. Now in Kenny's case, it wasn't. It was a. It was a. It was a bit of miscommunication and a lack of understanding of the flow between the sales rep, the district, uh, the uh, DC, and the dealer. So, thirty days later, Kenny doesn't have his fish food. You know. But if you guys have a problem, email me, Bob Lusk at Outlook.com. I'll send it to the powers that be, and you'll get fish food. When I found out about it from Kenny, well, one of the big hitters with Karina Mills is David Nelson. He got him a bag of fish food, UPSed it at his own expense. Danny Mac, Kelly Hart. Danny Mac says, make my day. Hey, Fred Bingham and Debbie said to tell you hello. And that I love him. <laughs> you might have heard her just then, and that she loves you. And Connie. And Connie. Jason Nips said, I have a patch of spiral eelgrass growing and noticed a decent amount of leaves floating as if they broke off. The area is fenced off to keep carp, turtles, and geese out. Do you know if it spreads by the leaves? Or does it need to be the runner things with a small root ball? Small root ball. Now, I don't have any idea why the, why the leaves broke loose. Typically, if you didn't have it in an exclusion fence, I'd tell you that something chewed it off. There's Ron Ardouin. All right. Um, let's see. Jacob West is checking in tonight. There's Billy Bates, Chris Aguilard. I laughed about your Fletcher Cox story last week when he played. All you had to do is look for the opponent's quarterback. That's where he was on the field. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yep. And I, I didn't know. I just, I didn't. I've kind of stopped following the NFL, you know, because I don't believe in their politics. I don't think that, I think if they're going to be athletes, go be an athlete. You know, if the NFL is going to, Sponsor football, play football. <clears throat> I don't want to hear how you vote. I don't want to hear what you think. I don't care about that. Any more than you guys want to hear my political stance. I don't care. So I was a little disenfranchised or felt disenfranchised and just I quit following. But you know, I part of me is gonna watch Fletcher Cox from now on. Mike McPherson <clears throat> finally got around to testing my pond, and after the last rain, the algae seemed to go away. That sure could be, that's typical, because typically when you see algae, it's floating and it's dead. And when the rain falls, it breaks it up, knocks some of the gases out of it, it sinks to the bottom, finishes decomposing, and then feeds the next batch of algae that's gonna grow up. Oh, uh, let's see, um, pH was eight, ammonia 0 0.025, that's fine. Phosphate, one part per million. After doing a little reading, it would seem I'm feeling a little too much fish food? No, you're not feeding too much fish food. Um, I cut the feed them out in half and I believe it would also explain the algae. You know, Mike, if you're feeding the high quality like MVP or the sport fish, fish foods, th that conversion rate is so efficient that it doesn't crank out enough waste to really stimulate a plankton bloom. Now, if you're feeding a grain-based fish food, you know, like the... Um, Oh, like the catfish foods or tilapia foods, feeds like that. That, that the, the, 
that can stimulate more of an algae bloom. Chuck Brinkman, we need to talk about Chuck for a minute. <clears throat> it's, uh, oh, I guess it was, I don't know, Friday night maybe. Chuck called me and he says, hey man, I got a little problem and I want to, I think I do, I want to know what's going on. He said, uh, we've had a, we had a heavy rain. My pond temperature went from the 80s and we, now the air temperature is 50 degrees. The temperature's plummeted. There's an odor, a little bit of an odor, and my fish are coming to the top like they're starving. What do I need to do? I said, right now, you need to move water. So uh, we talked about it. He had a, a sump pump, an electric sump pump. I had him put it in a bucket and water three feet deep, run a PVC pipe up out of the water, <coughs> 45 degree angle. He put a cap on it, drilled a slit in it, <coughs> started pumping water and blowing it back over the top of the pond. And if he had not done that, he would have had a major fish kill. Now, I've, I've talked about this on this show before. So one of the things, I've, and I've said this to Chuck right here on the show, one thing I'm worried about is your water chemistry. So what happened was he didn't have an aeration system. He had one ordered, and it was sitting at the his feed dealer's store waiting for him to go get it and install it. But in the meantime, when that cold front blew through, air temperatures dropped 30 degrees, plummeted the water temperature, that warm layer of water, the pond had already stratified, so he had a warm layer sitting on top of a cold layer. When that front blew through and you got the heavy rains on top of this warm water, it chilled, mixed with this, and probably got a little cooler, but shoved this toxic water to the top. Now all that water below the thermocline was anoxic, out of oxygen. So what that means is the problem he had was now his fish went from healthy, clean water at the top layer of the pond to either a mix of water or the, the toxic water at the top. And it was going to take it three or four days to regain its oxygen levels. Well, fish can't hold their breath any more than you can. <clears throat> 15 or 20 minutes with, with lower lethal levels of oxygen, the fish are going to die. Now, what happened was the, the, the uh, oxygen levels dropped to near fatal but there's a lot of other toxic gases that had built up in that pond. And the reason he knows that, and I know that, is he, as he walked around the pond, he could smell a musty odor, especially when he kicked that pump on. Well, that pond was regurgitating some of those toxic gases. So now I know he was going to go get uh, the aeration system and get it hooked up. And I told him to go ahead and run it just like the manufacturer said, keep his pump running. I think he ended up losing nine or 10 big bluegills. Now he's harvesting catfish. You know, so what, what's happened? Chuck has grown some giant fish way faster than anybody else because he's poured the feed to them. So here's an example where the biomass of fish had gotten to the point that they're metabolizing more waste than that pond could produce. And the price that you pay is if the water can't process it fast enough and you get an event like he did, then you're going to stand a chance to lose a few fish. Now, Chuck, if you want to type in and let people know, you know what you ended up losing. I know you lost nine or ten bluegills, but and I know that you went out and harvested some catfish. I expect that the water colors good by now. I expect that your fish are feeding well again. But I'd sure have that aeration system going and start harvesting some fish. Now, you can be picky about which ones you want to take. <coughs> Troy Todd, you got it. Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Roger Peterson, visibility is 12 inches. Yeah, you need to thin that out. If you've measured the visibility and it's 12 inches, you need your visibility here at the beginning of June to be 18 to 20 to 24 inches. That's what you want to do. Christopher Aguilar is here. Daddy's here. The uh, He is the daddy of Boudin. That's what he is. <coughs> Tori Rose, good to see Tori checking back in with us. Got a question about yellow grubs. If an infected fish gets eaten by a predatory fish, will the grubs be digested? Yes, they will. They'll be digested. The way that the, that the grubs get into the flesh of the fish is the uh, juvenile swims, breaks loose from... Uh, uh, it, it, the snails are the primary host, breaks loose, goes into a free-swimming phase, grabs the fish, migrates to its fins typically, goes under the fins and buries into the flesh. Or sometimes they'll bury in under a scale and then they'll uh, go through their process to um, metamorphosize, break loose, and swim back to the snails. But if they go into the digestive system of fish, they get digested. 
It's like if you eat that filet, it gets digested. Let me read the rest of that and make sure I didn't miss anything. <coughs> Couldn't find any studies on it. Well, there's your study right there. Live and in person. <laughs> okay, let me see here. Let me scroll down a little bit. I do want to tell you guys a little bit. It's already 10 till 7. I do want to tell you guys about the flood situation. How are you from Peaster? I'm not too far from Peaster. I'm in Glen Rose. Peaster's up north of Mineral Wells, boys and girls. Used to have a great baseball team in the 20s. My, my grandfather played there in Peaster. There you go. There's your little known fact for the day. They had a minor league baseball team back in the 20s. Okay, waiting until erosion and sediment controller are in place before the diffuser goes in. Undeveloped lots next door dumping a lot of silt in there. Looks like the minnows, red ear, and bluegill are spawning. Though. They will. Uh, they don't care so much about sediment other than if the sediment is settling. If it's settling out and settling into the, into the nest, then they're going to have to work hard. <coughs> J.P. Clayton is tuning in from Argentina. Going to be back in Hood County. Well... We were at uh, Pecan Plantation today, checking out our new digs, trying to figure out what color to paint it and where things are going to fit and all that. <coughs> so holler back, holler at me when you get back. JP lives in Pecan Plantation. Trevor Fry, got it. Danny Mac, easy for me to order from Amazon. Aquamac, $79 delivered. That's about $34 freight. Trevor Fry was speaking with Ron Ardwan about possibly culling eight to nine inch bluegill. My lake is producing 11 and a half inch bluegill. What are your thoughts? Um, I'd want to look at the population structure, Trevor. I'd want to see if those, if those, if you've got some one to twos, three to fives, five to sevens, <clears throat> some seven to eights as well as eight to nines coming up the pipe i'd say it would be okay to call a few eight to nines it would be also good to call a few sevens you know and that way you're recruiting younger stock to come up and outgrow and overtake those 11 and a half inch bluegill now when you hit 12 inches you're two pound your bluegills are two pounds so that's i know that's a big goal for a lot of folks it's a big goal for me Billy Miller, I removed about 100 largemouth bass and 250 black crappie from a four plus acre pond. I don't have a lot of bluegill, so I'm getting a thousand two to four inches delivered on Friday. Have I removed enough predators to give my bluegill a fair shot at making it to adults? I run two bags of MVP through my Texas hunter per month and a half for three years, but I don't see a lot of bluegill taking it due to the low numbers. I'm jealous of the videos of feeding frenzies. Videos, and that's what I want. Any other tips I should be doing? Yeah, I'll tell you what I would do. I would weigh and measure some of those bass and track that. Uh, send me an email and ask me for the uh, spreadsheet, and I'll send you the spreadsheet. Once you see your bass getting at and above the standard weight chart, that's when you can back off on culling. Now, I'm going to presume 100 largemouth bass is a good start. That's 25 per acre. And the crappie, that's even more important because they're going to eat your little bitty bluegills. So culling those crappie, that's, that's good. Feed the bluegills. Feed them in shallower water too. At least one feeder. If you feed them over deeper water, you're gonna lure them into where they'll get eaten. <coughs> we need to get together soon, bring Debbie and install my new fountain. How about if I bring Debbie and we hire somebody to install your new fountain? Who's that? That's Fred. I'm there, baby. All right, Debbie said she's in. Travis Paul Smith, I told you my Texas hunter feeder quit working three weeks ago after all the rain. Didn't want to fight the mud, so last Friday I went to take it apart. But I guess what? It is working. Fish on that end of the pond are happy. That's good. Mike McPherson, feeding Aquamax 500. Should I be concerned about the phosphate level at this point? No, I would not. You know, now, of course, that's all relative. If you're a fish farmer and you're feeding 50 pounds a day in a two-acre pond, then we'll have a different discussion. But for recreational ponds, you know, feeding a pound or two a day, a 50-pound bag lasts a month. Don't worry about phosphates there. There's Dion Myers, Blair Ulring, Troy Seal. I'm glad you're back with us, buddy. Chris Fargalard, anybody else like chicken gizzards, fried chicken gizzards? About to fry some up. Honey, you want some chicken gizzards? Hey, man, Debbie would love some gizzards. 
<coughs> she loves gizzards. Andy Eddings, I lost five wheelbarrow loads of arm length catfish years ago to the pond turning over. Like you described, sad day for me. Man, I tell you, I, I feel that pain. I've had way too many calls from that kind of situation. Cody Smith is adding lily pads a bad idea. I have about a five acre pond that would be great for ecosystem, but I don't want it to be a problem. <clears throat> as long as, Cody, as long as you don't add invasive species, don't add American lotus, don't buy or go dig up fragrant white water lilies, go ahead and buy some of the uh, more um, cultured, cultivated ones like you'd get at a, uh, a water garden store. They don't, they're not nearly as invasive. Now, one thing I would do is when you get them, plant them inside an exclusion fence. Get some chicken wire or some welded wire. Make a 12 inch uh, diameter cylinder out of that wire. Shove it in the mud. Make sure it's, it sticks out of the water a little bit. Plant it inside that so it can get established. If you don't, <coughs> then turtles will come around, snip it off right, right on the stem. Steve Ellison, hello from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Having trouble finding a contractor to finish my quarter acre pond. You know, I don't know what to tell you there. Winston-Salem, let's see, that's Wake Forest. Um, trying to think who there is. I'll tell you what you do, call Johnny Foster, Foster Lake Management. Checking with those guys, I guarantee you he knows somebody. He's out of Garner. <coughs> He's a little bit ways down the road, but you can check him out. <coughs> Wyatt says, hope to going well with the new house. Wondering how the rise in water level would change bass stocking. American Sport Fish, <coughs> F1's next week. Any worries with the pond turning over with the water level rise? No, you should not be worried about the pond turning over with a brand new pond. Uh, things are going well with the new house. Um... No, I wouldn't worry about it at all. Now, I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about this here in just a minute. I'm going to try to catch up on these questions. Greg Thomas, howdy. <coughs> Christopher Aguilar, can't even explain to you the growth difference in my fish since he switched to Aquamax. Greg Thomas, looking for some affordable suggestions to add cover to a local lake, Old Rock Quarry Pond, that floods annually due to its proximity to a local river. Uh, PVC pipe, you know, making something of some mass. Um, not sure what you mean by affordable. Some of that to me is relative because, you know, if you buy the bullet and you buy something like Mossbacks now, in 20 years you're not putting anything else out there. <coughs> if budget's a big deal, I'd probably see if I could go cut some brush and trees and, and do some things like that. Uh, Chuck Brinkman, I was darn lucky. No, you really weren't. You headed it off. Lost a dozen bluegill. <coughs> yep. You guys can read <coughs> what he's talking about there. Jeff Wallen, starting to dry out. Water's been dirty all spring. Is it time for some pond dye? If you're interested in growing fish, don't put pond dye in this time of year because you will disrupt your natural food chain. Pond dye is okay early spring, late winter, but right now I wouldn't do it. There's Kim Moore checking in from Central Illinois. Good to see you, girl. Congratulations on the new house. Thank you very much. Uh, can you use pelletized lime on ponds? Yes, you can. The Just make sure... Here's the deal on lime. Make sure it's calcium carbonate. Not calcium sulfate. Not calcium hydroxide. You don't want hydrated lime. You don't want quick lime. You want calcium carbonate dolomitic lime or ag lime that's what you want all right let me go down here a little bit more here and then we're going to talk about floods is there a pond size that can reduce the risk of a turnover fish kill <coughs> also we're replacing car wash equipment in pecan plantation this week <coughs> well you know what we drove by car wash in pecan plantation today didn't know there was one but we saw it huh i'll, I'll, I'll look for that I don't know if you still have twin distributing on your trucks or not, but by golly, I'll be looking. Tony Sutton checking in from Oklahoma. Oh, okay, pond size that can reduce the risk of a turnover. Um, you know, really, the risk of a fish kill from a turnover is based on the nutrient load being input and how much water sits below the thermocline. Most ponds, this is interesting, most ponds 
uh, will stratify halfway down. So if it's 10 feet deep, thermocline at five feet. If it's 20 feet deep, thermocline at 10 feet. But there was a lake uh, that was, uh, this is pretty interesting, a uranium mine. A 60 acre lake near Carn City, Texas that I got to study a little bit four or five years ago that had a massive turnover and killed every fish in it. Now what I didn't know was how deep it was. So we went and started studying it. This lake, about 60 acres or so, perfectly around a uranium mine. I guess you gotta get two ounces of uranium out of a whole block I'm gonna describe to make it worth it. But the spoils of this mine were lining two thirds of the perimeter of this hole in the ground. And those spoils were 50 feet tall. And I'm, I'm 50 feet above natural ground level. You couldn't drive up it. You couldn't drive on top of it. I don't know how they did it, but there was a, and I could see it on my depth finder, there was a road that spiraled down to the bottom of that thing, 130 feet deep. So the thermocline sat at about 15 feet deep on this lake due to the, just due to the fact that it couldn't shove hot water down any farther than that, or, or hot air any further than that. So when that thing turned over, two thirds of the water in it was below the thermocline. <clears throat> so what we tried to do was figure out how could we aerate that lake with bottom diffused aeration 130 feet deep. Well, you can't. So we worked with four different aeration manufacturers to come up with a game plan. The best thing they could come up with was to put some floating islands out there and suspend a platform down about 40 feet deep, which about is, is about as deep as you can push air down in that water and still make it efficient. And the, the cost was so much that the landowner said, you know what, I think I'd rather just take the risk of the fish kill and it would cost me a third of that to buy more fish. So he chose not to do it. Karina Mills and Texas Hunter commercial time. Hey, that's right. You know what? Thanks, Travis. Appreciate the nudge, buddy. <laughs> you know, I really, really do appreciate our sponsors. If it wasn't for Purina Mills helping sponsor this show, you know, I really appreciate that. Even with some of the junk they have to go through with the distribution, they've got great fish food. I'm just going to tell you to hang in there, find a dealer that'll get it for you. Some of them will, some of them won't. I've actually gone to, to feed stores where the dealer charged me for Purina game fish chow and gave me another brand. When I went to load it up, I had him unload it, went back to the counter, and I said, hey, I asked for game fish chow. I was gonna shoot a commercial for Purina. I said, I need game fish chow. He said, well, this is the same thing. I said, no, it's not. <laughs> you know, this game fish chow, you know, you charged me for game fish chow, and I'm buying a bag of fish food that's $5 cheaper. <clears throat> I don't want that. So, and that's happened to me one time, one time. And this is one of my local dealers, which I didn't get that. But I love Purina Mills. Since 1995, uh, they have leaned on me and I've leaned on them. You know, Texas Hunter, best fish feeder out there by far. Now, there are other fish feeders, you bet. But I would put Texas Hunter up there at the top, not only for the quality of their products, but also for the quality of their customer service. Uh, my son Jonathan's feeder quit working and I went down to test it for him, and it looked to me like the battery might have been too low. So I, on my phone right then, like 2.45 in the afternoon, sent an email to Chris Blood. <coughs> he fired an email right back to me. He says, Bob, that's probably the battery. I'll, you'll have a brand new battery tomorrow. I'll ship it today. It'll go out UPS in 10 minutes, and I'll also send a timer just in case. If it's not, send the timer back. What kind of service is that? He sent that. It was the battery, fired it right back up, and there it goes. Also, appreciate David Schneiderman, Easy Docs of Texas as a sponsor, and Greg Grimes with Aquatic Environmental Services. So appreciate all you guys. Got mine today, 10 acre trophy bass pond. There it is, right here, here it is. Right, here it is, right there. There's the most recent issue of Pond Boss. I love the postal service. We sent checks to uh, some of our riders <coughs> for the uh, March-April issue and got emails from three of them last week. He said, hey, did you send a check? And Leanne said, send them an email. Yeah, I sent it to you. I'll send another one out right now. So checks that were mailed on March the 15th 
all three of those riders got their checks on the same day they got the, the makeup check, all because of the post office. So if you just got it today, it was mailed, the May, June issue was mailed on, I think it was about April the 30th through there somewhere. So one month later, you've got it. Glad you got it. <clears throat> I'm glad you like that 10 acre pond. That, that really is a good article. It's really a great article. Jason Rayfield, just got a half acre pond covered in duckweed. What's your best recommended herbicide or best way to fight it? You know, if you if you can tackle that early in the spring, I, I really like fluoridone, but there's a lot of risk with that because you've got to put it in. It's got to contact those plants at a certain amount for 90 days. So if you have any flushing going on, you've got to replace it. So I'll tell you what do. Go to aquaplant.com, which is Texas A&M's uh, aquatic plant website. Look up duckweed, and there's four or five different <coughs> options in there that you can take deal with it. <coughs> Ray Riley, tell me about mud cats. Some say they throw some. Oh, some say eat some. Some say throw in the bank. Are they beneficial or harmful to your body? Well, I'll tell you what, bull, bullheads, a couple of things I'm going to tell you. First of all, they're predators. People think they're trash fish. And they do live in the mud. I mean, they'll shove their faces right down in the mud, and that's where they'll hang out. But I have electrofish bullheads with frogs, turtles, and shad in their gullets. A pound and a half bullhead had a, a seven or eight inch gizzard shad down its gullet. So they're predator fish. They're prolific Reproduce like crazy. You'll see little clouds of baby ones moving in unison about this time of year. Um, some people say eat them. I tell you who eats them. The, our northern friends eat them because bullheads are full of fat typically, and in the fall when they start to go dormant, like a lot of the other fish do, they absorb that fat. And then after ice off, when the ice melts, uh, people go fishing, catch a bunch of bullheads. That's when they're great to eat because they're coming out of the winter, they metabolize their fat, their flesh is pure, it's cold, it's good to eat. <clears throat> so depending on where you are, whether you want to eat them or not, and frankly how hungry you are, I have fried and eaten a whole lot of them on the creek bank. I was 12, but and I'm not so hungry now to eat a bullhead anymore, except in the north coming out of winter. Um, are they beneficial or harmful? If, if they're not a target species, they're not beneficial. Now, the ways they can be harmful is if they become the dominant fish species. If they dominate your pond, they're going to take up space. They're going to stir up mud. They're going to compete with your other fish. So that's how they can be detrimental or harmful. Look at that. Dave Weber outside of Kansas City, waxing poetic. Greeted the sunrise, piercing through a shot of fog over the river this morning with a cup of joe on the back porch with my magazine that came yesterday. Couldn't put it down for an hour, over an hour. I love Dave Weber. I was fixing to smart off to him, but I'm not going to do it. I was going to say, it took you an hour? <laughs> hey, life is good. I appreciate that. That's great. Uh-oh, Josie's making fun of us. Aggie's over here. Holy cow, you guys. Jonathan Hernandez hanging out. You know, you're hanging around with pretty questionable company as it is. Let's talk about this flood a little bit. I want to talk about drought. <clears throat> and I want to talk about DIY analyzing your pond. So, I got a call today from uh, Big O, Steve Parks, the owner of Rage Tail Baits. Now, Steve bought a ranch out east of Abilene, Texas, near the little town of Clyde, south of Baird, between Baird and Clyde, south of Interstate 20. And on it resides an old, old, old flood prevention lake built in the late, uh, early, late 50s, early 60s. That lake probably covers 15 acres. The dam is riprap top to bottom because it's rocky soils over there. So what Big O wanted to do, which he did, he wanted to, this lake is shaped like a, uh, like a boomerang. It sweeps around like that. The dam's right, right there at the confluence of two creeks. <coughs> so Big O... <clears throat> went over to the to the smallest leg of this of this boomerang and he built a dam taking dirt from the flood prevention lake which was had a lot of clay in it so he built a dam and created himself about an eight acre lake inside this flood control lake 
And then he drained the flood control lake. Now this, this, this small lake, he calls it the jungle lake because the shoreline is just covered in brush, button brush, uh, different short oak trees, all kinds of brush, solid rock top to bottom, rock piles, perfect habitat for bass, bass and bluegill. Well, that thing filled up <coughs> enough that we could put uh, forage fish in it, which we did that in the fall. Then he continued to slowly rise over the winter. Then he got these back-to-back -back torrential rains. And in the meantime, he opened the valve and drained that flood prevention lake and got it down to the burrow pit. We went in and rope gnomed all the fish. It was full of carp and buffalo and gizzard shad, white crappie, um, ghost minnows, silver sides, stuff like that. So we took all those fish out, knocked them out. And during this span of time, he took, he owns a bunch of heavy equipment. He deepened the whole lake, got rid of a bunch of silt, reshaped the shorelines, and they started getting these back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back rains. Well, when there was about four feet of water in this, the, the FP site, the flood prevention site, then we added fathead minnows and bluegill and red ear sunfish. Then the big rains came. Well, that lake filled up about six feet over the overflow pipe, which is designed to do, which pushed the water up on his dam on the other side of the boomerang. And it started pushing water over his spillway going backwards. And as the lake began to recede, the water turned and ran the other way, like it's supposed to, over the spillway. <coughs> it started chewing out the back side of his dam. Now here's the moral of the story. Some water is predictable, but when water reaches certain elevations, once it really gets up there and it's moving fast, it's going to seek the path of least resistance. And in this case, it started pushing. There's water coming into that jungle lake from that fork and then water pushing against it coming up from the, the rest of that flood prevention lake. So the bottom line was he couldn't raise his spillway up because he had it exactly where it needed to be. However, the water in the FP site got high enough that it started chewing away at the side of his spillway coming toward the dam. So he's going to have some pretty serious dirt work to do after that. Now, what did it do to his fish? Well, he's convinced that some of his bait fish swam from the jungle lake into the flood control lake. He calls it the soil conservation lake, which is very likely, that very likely happened. However, the flood lake is muddy and the other lake is not. So without a real forceful current forcing them to leave, odds are high he didn't lose nearly as many fish into the soil conservation lake as he thinks. Because fish's nature is to swim upstream. <clears throat> now, one thing that did very likely happen is there is a pretty big lake in the upper reaches of the watershed for this, and the likelihood of reintroduction of some of the trash fish like carp and gizzard shad is high. So his question to me was, should we let the lake recede and then talk about stocking bass? My answer to him was, yes, let's let the lake recede and stock bass and let's overstock the bass. I'd much rather see you come in with overstocked bass having a harvest crowded bass out of 20 total acres of water than having to deal with runaway, runaway populations of carp and gizzard shad. If we can get those bass in there, get them to grow fast enough, and the top side, the top, out of 200 bass per acre, 30 of those bass will gain two pounds between now and fall. If they can get that big, they can be instrumental and keeping these trash fish at bay. So I want him to get his good fish established before any trash fish can gain a very strong foothold. So he's got a source for those fish, and we'd had a different strategy. But I thought that was really pretty interesting. You know, just because Josie is burnt orange in her blood doesn't mean that she can't love on a little bit of maroon. Can I have an amen out there, Jonathan Hernandez? <coughs> Jamie Ivester, what's the best option for a quality water testing kit for a pond owner? Uh, you know, I like HACH, H-A-C-H. I like those. But if you'll spend some time 
on the Palm Boss Resource Guide. Just go to palmboss.com, click on the Resource Guide. There's several suppliers of, of products out there. Some of those folks sell different test kits, different uh, meters, things like that. So I'd go check that out. Drew Bachman, my fish are responding great to Purina Aquamax. Have a local feed and seed store that in multiple types in stock. Good to hear. All right, 715, let's talk about DIY analyzing your pump. All right. <coughs> Attaboy, Ray Riley. Gag him, buddy. <laughs> um, for those of you that watch this show regularly, you guys know that there are five key components to managing your pump. Say it with me out there. What's number one? Chuck Brinkman? That's right. Happy water. You got to have happy water. If you don't have happy water, none of these other things make any difference because your fish are distressed. They can't breathe right. If they're focused on suffocating, they can't be focused on growing. They're focused on not dying. You know, so happy water is number one. That's the most important thing. Make sure that you, there we go. Troy Todd's quick on the trigger there. All right, happy water. You got to have that. Now, if, if you don't know what I'm talking about there, I'm going to pause just for a minute, do a little, another little commercial. If you will, go to palmboss.com, look at the menu, the horizontal menu at the far end. There's one called Institute. Click on Institute. That will bring you up the uh, Institute of Higher Pondology. That is designed to help keep you from paying the dumb tax. And if I knew you better, I'd guarantee you it would save you more money than you'll spend buying that curriculum. If you want to buy all six modules, it's $495, or you can buy any of the six individually. If you're interested in managing fish, there's a really good one on fish management. <clears throat> but all this stuff I'm talking about, I really hammer it home in those tutorials. Plus, we're going to, and now once you buy in, if you buy the whole kit and caboodle at $495, that buys you permanent membership in there and we're gonna be adding some more videos in the next six or eight weeks. So the more we add, those you already paid for them once you're in. So uh, let's see, Travis Paul Smith, Habitat, that's number two. So Happy Water's number one, Habitat's number two. So in the case of Big O, worrying about his fish leaving, I said, Big O, you've got rock piles, you've got brush along the edges, you've got really good clean water with good clarity, you got a good food chain with the color of your water. Those fish don't want to go. Now, can some of them be forced out with the current? Yes, they can. Small ones can do that. The bigger ones don't. They tend to stay home or swim upstream. Now, I don't want to get any emails saying, well, I found a bunch of fish in a pasture. I know that. But I'm telling you, if you've got happy water and you've got the kind of habitat that is suitable for the different species, different size classes of those species, they're gonna be a lot less likely to leave and they're gonna thrive. The third one, food chain, they gotta have food. It takes 10 pounds of bait fish for a game fish to gain one pound. All right, the fourth thing is genetics. Gotta have good genetics to grow big fish. The fifth thing is harvest. Gotta have a good harvest plan. Now, <clears throat> what do you need to do to figure out how well your pond is thriving? Number one, you gotta know where you are. Is your water happy? Check. You have the right kind of habitat for all the different sizes of the different species of fish. If you have all that, check. What about your food chain? How do you know? Well, if you can go out and pull a short seine around the shore this time of year and you catch five different sizes of bluegills, have a couple of little bass jump over the net. If you can go catch some bass, weigh them and measure them and they're above what they should be according to the standard weight chart, then you're in good shape. So, what you got to do is you got to gather data. The more data you gather, the better decisions you can make. What's the clarity of your water? You know, we just went through with, with uh, Mr. Peterson, Roger Peterson. His visibility is 12 inches. That's a little bit too, um, too green going into June. Now, the saving grace is you just had a cool front. Now, if this was July, I'd say don't hit the panic button, but don't, don't let any grass grow on your feet. You know, go get it. Get it, knock it down. You want your visibility to be 18 inches. And here we are, end of May, 1st of June, 12 inches. It doesn't spook me too bad. <clears throat> but here's what you do there. 
Watch the color of your water change. Measure visibility. I don't want you guessing at it. Buy a Sechi disc. Here's your first commandment from the book of Bob. Go buy a Sechi disc. And then use it. And then write down your visibility. If your visibility decreases, the water is green in July, do something about it. If the visibility increases and, the, and it goes from a pea soup green to kind of an olive green to more of a greenish olive to a brownish olive to a brown, that's normal. You know, so understanding how your water works. If you got the right kind of habitat, you got spawning beds for your bluegills, how many pounds of bait fish does it take to grow a pound of game fish? What's that? Yeah, every one of you yelling at your phone. Ten. That's right. Ten. Or in the case of Wayne and Josie in the Hernandez batch, you're yelling at a big screen TV at a great big guy with a round face. Ten. Ten pounds. Okay, so you've got to be having places those fish can reproduce. You need places fish can congregate. You need to have, weigh and measure a bunch of game fish. Compare them to your relative weight chart. So if you're measuring the visibility of your water and you can pull the same through and verify reproduction and different size classes of your bait fish and your game fish are at or above the weight they need to be, catch and release is your order. Now, if you're catching a size class of bass, for example, they're underweight, that's a sure sign that you need to be culling some bass. So DIY pond management starts with Make sure your water's happy, which means you need schooling on water. Make sure you got the right kind of habitat in the right places. 25% of a lake covered with habitat is the right number. If you get if if, the, if your pond has got bushy pond weed, American pond weed, eelgrass, and it covers 70% of the pond, it's too much. Too much. Now I don't run across too many ponds or lakes that has too much habitat, but I run across a lot of them that don't have quite enough. So make sure you've got that element. And then be sure that your food fish are spawning. If you need to feed the fish, feed the fish. Feeding the fish expedites growth rates and increases reproduction. That's one of the reasons I harp on feeding. I love feeding fish. I think that, you know, we live in a fast food world. We do. You pull up to the microphone, you order it, and then you start looking at your clock. And by the time, I can't tell you how many times I've gone through a dadgum fast food joint and I'm third one in line, and it's been eight minutes, and I'm thinking, I'm going to pull out of here and go. I usually don't, but I have. You know, so what I'm saying is one of the ways to fast food concept your fish is to feed them. Travis said in genetics, yeah, we talked about that. When I found this page two years ago, my fish were like peewee football team. Now they're a Super Bowl contender. Your information is second to none. Hey, thanks. Is there other information? <laughs> Kevin Matney, how do I stop cranes from eating all your fish? <coughs> um, <laughs> coming from the peanut gallery, the queen says, shoot them. I'm going to tell you don't shoot them. Uh, I've got to tell this story on her. We're going to run out of time in a minute. But I remember way, way, way back, golly, this had to be like 2005, four through there somewhere. We had just bought our place, Lusk Lodge, comma two, that we just sold. And Debbie was having coffee out on the back patio. I'd set a feeder up on the, the swimming pond. The swimming pond was maybe a year old. And we had some really nice bluegills. We had some five to seven inch bluegills. And uh, every time the feeder would go off, she well, she called me one day. I was in upstate New York working on a project up there at Savannah Dew. Yep, Ron knows this story. Dion knows, oh, I guess I've told this story way too much. But anyway, she called me and she said, hey, Lusk, where's your shotgun? I've got a 410 my daddy gave me when I was 12. And I said, why do you want my shotgun? She said, well, this big, tall, big, tall gray bird just, just speared a bluegill over by the feeder and is trying to eat it and I want to shoot it. And I said, well, honey, that's a great blue heron. It's against the law to shoot him. And he's just trying to make a living. She said, oh. Well, I got home about five days later. I'm sitting outside with her while she's having coffee. Feeder goes off, fish are boiling the water. Here comes this dead gum, great blue heron, lands, spears about an eight inch bluegill, throws it up on the bank and is chomping on it. And I got up, she said, where are you going? So I'm gonna go get that shotgun. She said, you're not gonna shoot lurch, are you? She'd name the damn bird. So here's your, here's your answer. 
Great blue herons, single birds like that are not going to devastate your fishery. Uh, they're going to eat some of your best fish. So here's what we did. Since Lurch figured out how to play the feeder game, I set the feeder to go off at midnight for a few weeks, and that cured it. So I didn't get to watch the fish eat unless I want to stay up till midnight, which I did a few times. Uh, but they don't disrupt a population. Now, they're going to eat some individuals. They're going to thin the numbers a little bit, but they're not going to disrupt the population. I like Vito's idea. He's got... His dogs chase him off. And you know what? We had a we had a, a great Pyrenees that did the same thing. Anytime he saw that heron, he'd go bark at it. And there it would go. Okay, hey, I'm about to get ready to wrap it up. Let's see. Yeah, so we talked DIY pond management. <clears throat> Make sure your water's happy. Habitat's good. Make sure you know your habitat's good. The number one problem I come across with habitat is not enough. You know, folks will put out, I was talking to a guy today that, that uh, yesterday that put out some pallets and he put out some um, gravel beds. What he did was great. Then he sent me pictures and it was sparse. So he and I are going to have a conversation in a couple of days. I'm going to tell him he needs more of that. You know, so he did He did good. Um, hey, there's Joe Sipes. Hey, Baylor, put granular herbicide on the coastal. Big range came, total fish kill. Pond is decimated. How long will it take for that stuff to dissipate? I was thinking I'd wait until I see an algae bloom. Um, Joe, I hate that for you. Um, one of the things I'd want to do, I'd want to investigate the herbicide. And what you can do is you can post a question right here on this thread and tag Kelly Duffy. And we'll get Kelly involved in that and he can tell you about that. It totally depends on the herbicide, which one it is. You know, and I'd want to read the label and just see what's going on. Ray Riley, is your opinion on water turkeys the same as your opinion on cranes? Absolutely not. Uh, even though I can't tell you to, to shoot water turkeys, I would tell you to assist in their suicides every way possible. You don't want them out there. You don't want cormorants. When you see that first cormorant show up, that's the scout bird. It's going to come eat your fish and then go tell the flock, hey, Ray Riley has got a load of fish over here. Let's go, boys. Take the whole flock, and then you're done. You don't want water turkeys. Uh, I can't tell you to shoot them because that's against the law. Uh, I can't even tell you to spook them off. But I can tell you, you don't want them there. You figure out the method. Chris Blood, thanks. For, Chris, we love you, buddy. We love Texas Hunter. Had some good things to say about you guys a while ago. Appreciate Texas Hunter and my good friend, Chris Blood. <clears throat> Tom Blasdell is sitting here watching a great blue heron in his backyard doing his thing. It can be kind of mesmerizing and entertaining how a bird with beady little eyes, a tiny little brain, and such a long beak be patient, waiting in water that it doesn't get up to its tail feathers and eat. Pretty amazing. All right. So, hey, we're going to wrap it up. Hey, don't forget Pond Boss Magazine. 35 bucks a year, folks. 35 bucks. Listen to me. 35 bucks. A year's worth. I promise you, you'll get a nugget out of each one. This next issue has got some of the best content that we've ever had. We've got four case studies. We've got one on the intermittent narration. I've got, I've got several really good fish stories. We've got a six-part series coming up, number one in the series, about building Lake Deanna outside of Kansas City in Drexel, Missouri. So subscribe to Pond Boss. You can do that by going to pondboss.com and click on the link that says subscribe or call the office, 903-564-5344. 903-564-6144, or go to pondboss.com. Listen, I really appreciate you guys and gals watching this show, and uh, I'm glad we got to end this one without the frenzy like we had last time. All is good. Uh, we're uh, I'm not sure where I'll be next week, but wherever we are, we got a good sale. We'll be coming at you live. So once again, thanks. Adios.